Well, thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, my name is Rick Rosso. I hold the India chair here at CSIS. Uh, for about three and a half years, I've been, uh, I've been working here. Um, for those of you that uh, have not been to a CSIS event or those that have, you'll recognize it. The first thing we always do is our, uh, our safety warning, just in case something goes wrong, a fire alarm or landslide or something else. I am your designated safety officer. So in between the screams and shouts, uh, look for my hand. <laughs> I may ask uh, Ambassador Singh, who's a bit taller, to raise his hand instead, though. But, uh, and uh, the, our meeting space, just in case something happens, is back behind the National Geographic Museum, uh, just, uh, just down uh, uh, 17th Street there. But uh, we don't expect anything to take place. Um, we first started talking about this with the Delhi Policy Group um, probably six or eight months ago. Not, of course, realizing at the time that uh, it would be uh, really fortuitous timing ahead of the first summit. Uh, we didn't know who would win the election. We didn't know, of course, all this stuff, but then the first summit coming up uh, so quickly. Uh, Prime Minister Modi arrives on Sunday for a two-day visit to Washington, D.C. And um, while, you know, the, the U.S.-India uh, relationship has many pillars, uh, I think probably few have seen more progress in the last couple of years than the, uh, the defense relationship. Uh, seeing the types of substantive agreements we've signed, uh, the deepening of the types of exercises that we do, increased military sales, but also carving out some really unique spaces for India. You know, programs like the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, <coughs> establishing the India Rapid Reaction Cell inside the Pentagon, all these are sort of novel things we created just for this one uh, relationship. I don't think uh, either in terms of diaspora ties, even energy, or certainly not economic ties, have you seen quite that expanse of, uh, of progress. So. Here we are uh, able to offer a bit of a scene setter ahead of the first summit uh, for some of the great experts, um, both uh, within CSIS, uh, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, uh, and then as well as our friends from the Delhi Policy Group to offer up some ideas on, on where are those convergences, um, or is it possible uh, that we may see you know, some types of frictions, but, um, but why does it make sense and what are the kinds of things that we might see together to make this defense relationship uh, continue to move forward as it's done in recent years. So uh, let me uh, first introduce my, my panelists here in the order that they'll present, um, and then I'll hand the floor over. Uh, Dr. Kath Hicks, I think everybody that showed up in this building knows, and she, uh, she laid the cornerstone for it. <laughs> uh, Kenry Kissinger, Chair and Director of the National International Security Program here at CSIS. Uh, between CSIS and the Pentagon, uh, she has spent uh, the last number of years, most recently at her time at the Department of Defense, was Principal Deputy Undersecretary for Policy. Uh, immediately to my left, uh, Ambassador uh, Hemant Singh, who's been a terrific partner and mentor for me after taking over and moving into think tank land, a place that he'd been inhabiting for years uh, already. Uh, Director General of the Delhi Policy Group uh, since June 2016. Uh, member of the Indian Foreign Service for decades, uh, going back to 1974 before that. Uh, serving in a number of important posts, uh, Indonesia, Colombia, uh, per Deputy Permanent Representative of the United Nations, but also very well known for being India's longest serving ambassador to Japan. Uh, to his left is Lieutenant General Anil Ahuja, 40 years of service uh, to his country in the Indian military, uh, including uh, Deputy Chief for Policy Planning and Force Development at the Joint Chiefs Headquarters. He also was co-chair uh, from the Indian side of the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative. Uh, so great to have uh, General Ahuja uh, joining us here as well, since he was such a vital interlocutor on this important program that, again, we created just for, just for India. Uh, and, then, uh, and then to his left is Brigadier Arun Segal, uh, Senior Fellow with Delhi Policy Group, uh, Executive Director of the Forum for Strategic <laughs> Initiatives, uh, 36 years himself in the service, uh, including the Office of Net Assessment, uh, the Integrated Defense Staff. So uh, couldn't ask for a better group uh, to help to try to offer a bit of illumination ahead of the big summit. Uh, let me first ask uh, Kath to talk a bit about you know, what we see so far in terms of Trump administration, priorities, foreign policy issues, and, and defense and security. Kath, please, over to you. Sure, that should be easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, the, as, as Rick said, the U.S.-India defense relationship has been um, um, such a stellar example of two key administrations and leaders over time looking to advance the relationship and what they can accomplish together. And there really is no reason why that shouldn't and won't continue. Um, that said, of course, like everything, this relationship will evolve inside a set of circumstances, um, domestic and international, uh, that could you know, forestall <coughs> little, little, I suppose could derail it, though I don't think that's likely, um, and uh, obviously could propel it. So I think that's what we will be looking for in this, in this upcoming um, first meeting. 
Um, I think some of the things that we've seen in the Trump foreign policy thus far that would sort of lead one to this question on the stability overall uh, and how it would affect whether positively or negatively really has to do, of course, with the president's own sense of um, the principles, if you will, that he, he likes to employ in foreign policy, and clearly unpredictability is one that he is extremely comfortable with. So whether by design or by default, by um, <coughs> intent or personality, what we have seen to date in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East is, you know, some amount of personal um, shifts in approach. We've seen a little bit of confusion between various members, a lot of confusion in some cases, various members of the administration trying to speak on behalf of the administration only to be contradicted or maybe it just at least a little bit of air gap left between the views of certain officials. Um, and that's created some amount of confusion, certainly for allies and partners, and you know, questionably also potentially for for, uh, for those who would threaten our interests um, and, and not be a benign view or a viewer who would seek to, uh, to undertake opportunity in this environment. Certainly concerned about that with Russia, um, but also North Koreans have been very clear um, in taking advantage, if you will, of opportunities to demonstrate uh, <coughs> their intent in this environment. So, how does this affect? The U.S.-India relationship. Well, let me just talk about U.S. As I said, I, I think there's a lot of reason to hope that there'll be continuity in the in the most positive of senses, and maybe even the ability to to push forward further. But I do think the overall U.S. rebalance, as it was called in the last administration to Asia, is still vulnerable in some ways. I don't think this administration will walk away from the concept of it. I'm sure the terminology will change. That's what administrations do. But it's been a strong bipartisan um, pillar of US foreign policy for some time to have uh, a focus on Asia. The economics certainly argue for it, as well as the security issues. Again, North Korea already appears to be a central uh, foreign policy challenge set of focus for this administration. So they're already looking at Asia, and it's in their you know, in their minds uh, mm -hmm. each and every day. But there are some real problems that um, you could even say were inherited from the last administration or the last several administrations that this administration seems to be doubling down on that I, uh, caused me to worry about the overall shift to Asia and then how it might affect the U.S.-India relationship. The first of these has been uh, very much focused on the defense side. Um, certainly with the collapse of TPP, the throwing out of TPP, um, and no, um, beyond a few ambassadorial appointments, almost no diplomatic heft being pushed into the region, let alone economic heft into the region. Really the only standing pillar is the intent of the Trump administration to continue investments in defense. But even there, the second problem is there's an <coughs> under-resourcing. As I already mentioned, there's an under-resourcing we know on the diplomatic side. There seems to be an under-recessing of intellectual capital on the economic side in terms of the administration's approach to Asia. Um, and when it comes to the defense side, there is an expected increase in defense spending, uh, but it's not of such a substantial nature that it fundamentally alters um, the, the, the challenge that the Defense Department faces with regard to the global uh, threats uh, operations of its forces need to develop long-term capabilities, particularly with regard to a country that paces us so well in some areas as China, and the budget. Um, so that circle is not being, is not being um, squared effectively, as you might say in Washington. And then the last piece, I think, is that, um, as I said, there's a lot of confusion about what exactly our goals are. And I think this is probably the most problematic for the U.S.-India relationship. Is really is it's, as it could it could fall prey to, as a byproduct to confusion over the U.S.-China relationship, the U.S. relationship with uh, Japan, which certainly has uh, post Abe visit seems to be going well, but I think everyone is always waiting on pins and needles for another shoe to drop. We have an upcoming visit uh, with the uh, the Koreans, uh, South Koreans, that could also you know play a factor in here. And of course, there's the personalities involved in the in the upcoming. Um, India visit, you know, it's always hard to know, even if you tee the whole situation up well, if it will deliver well as an exchange, whether personalities will mesh, um, or whether it could go a little off the rails, which I think we all secretly have a fear, even if it's a 1% chance that um, that could do harm that goes beyond a particular engagement. 
So that's sort of the tee up for, for how um, I think you know, we should be thinking about the overall foreign policy as it relates to this engagement. But I just want to end on a positive note by saying okay. where I started, I do think there is every reason to hope that we are, the U.S.-India defense relationship in particular is, is a sweet spot for the United States and for India to progress um, in this administration just as it did in the last. Oh, thanks, Kath. Well, now it gives me great pleasure to turn the uh, microphone over to Ambassador H.K. Singh. Uh, if there's one or two of you in this room who are not yet on the mailing lists for Delhi Policy Group, I strongly urge you to do so. It's one of the most powerful voices now in all of Asia in terms of the, uh, the positives and negatives of integration, of consternation, uh, the materials they put out both on economic and security relations, not just uh, India's own views, are, are very powerful. So it's great to have you as a partner in this endeavor. And over to you, sir. Thanks, Rick. Uh, if I speak too loudly, just remind me. Uh, pinch okay. me or do something. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back here at CSIS. And uh, uh, I thank all of you turning up because uh, <coughs> it's a full house. Um, what I will do uh, is to give you a general overview of uh, uh, how we see uh, the situation developing uh, in terms of both security and, and defense matters. And then my colleagues uh, uh, will specifically turn to defense uh, uh, partnership, that is General Ahuja, and uh, Brigadier Segal will talk about the political military scenarios of Asia, uh, which are also very important. So let me talk to you uh, about uh, a few, just a couple of points about India, then a little bit about India's outlook towards national power, uh, and then uh, our India's security role, and uh, conclude with a few points on uh, our defense uh, uh, relationship with the US and the importance of managing Asia. Um, we are at a meeting at a time of uh, disruptive change, uncertainty, power transitions, and strategic competition. So it, there's a lot of things going around. Uh, when you try to look for stability in, in such a situation, it's, uh, it's always comforting. And I'm happy to share with you that uh, in terms of uh, our domestic uh, stability, uh, as well as uh, the predictability of our external posture, uh, we bring that kind of uh, uh, certainty. Um, domestically, our prime minister uh, is uh, uh, immensely popular across the country. Um, since in America, you used to polls, so I'd, I'd say the latest polls, 76% support is unprecedented. Uh, the BJP itself, which is the party which he leads, uh, is uh, in a situation where uh, they are emerging as the uh, leading party of national governance. Uh, polls again. 84% support for the re-election, if elections uh, were held today. Uh, and uh, as far as our economy is concerned, uh, there I use IMF figures because my daughter is sitting at the back and she's at the IMF and I, <laughs> I can't but... Uh, <laughs> um, well, the IMF figures for this year, 7.2% growth, next year 77 we We'd probably end up doing better because uh, uh, there are already uh, winds of change blowing in that direction. India's contribution to aggregate world growth is 15.2%. Uh, this is growing year after year. Uh, if we meet again in four or five years' time, it probably would have gone beyond 20%. But uh, even now, it is very significant. Uh, externally, you have seen the last three years of the Modi government. Uh, I was here speaking at CSIS two weeks after he assumed office. So uh, uh, this is a good moment to, to revert to that. Um, foreign policy completely transformed. Pragmatic partnerships with all major powers. Commitments to regional and global stability and security. These are new elements which he has brought in along, along with his uh, vision. Uh, as he says, India is not standing in a corner. Uh, as far as the relationship with the United States is concerned, uh, he, he, in his words, 
we have overcome the hesitations of history. Uh, the U.S. relationship is at the apex of India's priorities. And uh, we've all alluded to the summit, which is coming in a week's time. We'll wa wait and see the results. Um, as far as our Trump administration contacts thus far are concerned, uh, very positive interactions uh, in terms of phone calls as well as meetings. Uh, likelihood of continuity on geopolitical convergences, uh, security partnership, and defense cooperation. Uh, let's see what uh, the outcomes of the summit will bring in that direction. I, it, I would really like to for you for you to know what is India's national power outlook. What do we do? Where, where, where does our power go? There are four or five elements of it. Um, we have both uh, uh, strategic deterrence as well as conventional deterrence uh, built into the system. I will not go into that because the generals will uh, will deal with that. Uh, but in terms of comprehensive national power, I already alluded to our fast-growing economy, uh, greater contributions to aggregate world growth. Uh, we have very significant capabilities in certain important areas, the strategic area, the space area, the IT area, the cyber area, and the military uh, fields. So that's a, that's a strong component of our, our power outlook. Um, as far as how we use this power is concerned, India is uh, a status quo power. Uh, we use our diplomacy and our military strength uh, to craft stable regional balances across Asia, uh, support the global co uh, respect for the global commons and the rule of law, and gradually move into the space of providing net security provision to the countries of our neighborhood. Um, in terms of uh, India's security role, turning to that security role now. Uh, again, I'd remind you uh, in, 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 in the terms described by Mike Green, uh, who's sitting upstairs, we just had a meeting with him. Um, the United States' long-term goals have been to preserve, to, to prevent any ex exclusive control over Asia or the Pacific by a hegemonic power. So in uh, translating that on a more uh, modest level to, uh, to how India looks at this, uh, our concerns are mainly to maintain the sanctity of our borders and preventing exclusive dominance over the Indian Ocean region by any hegemonic power. Um, we are fortunate to be able to leverage our geographical advantages uh, in the region. Uh, we have island sentinels, both to the east and the west of us, which are straddling the major gateways to the Indian Ocean region. Um, how do we then move from there to, to be more of a net security provider? Uh, our military capacity support is ongoing for about a dozen countries, uh, from the African coasts all the way up to Southeast Asia, uh, ending in Vietnam. Um, it, it also includes uh, uh, maritime surveillance chains uh, which are being built uh, uh, in the island territories uh, across the Indian Ocean. We have uh, very, uh, we have long-standing arrangements with Indonesia, Myanmar, and Thailand uh, on maritime security patrols. Uh, we also finally have uh, the pillar of our approach to security in the region is our two trilaterals. The, at the apex is the India-US-Japan uh, trilateral, which is up to the ministerial level. And uh, the second one is the India-Japan-Australia trilateral, which is uh, up to the undersecretary level. Uh, these trilaterals comprise security dialogues, uh, military exercises, mainly in the maritime domain, and uh, interoperability arrangements. Uh, we have a functioning LEMOA with the, with the United States. Uh, the generals will talk more about these issues. Uh, just a couple of words about India-U.S. defense ties. Uh, mm, well, basically, let me talk about burden sharing. Uh, India pays for its own defense, and India assumes on its own the responsibilities which it has to uh, towards the maritime domain of the Indian Ocean. Uh, I mentioned the sentinels which we are, uh, which we are uh, building in the islands. 
Uh, I also mentioned the security partnerships, which especially the trilaterals. Our fleet deployments are a indicator of how this progresses. Uh, in the last uh, 90 days or so, our Western fleet has been all across the Western Indian Ocean, all the way up to the Mediterranean, and to our special partners in Europe, including the UK and France. Uh, it has uh, the, our uh, uh, Eastern Fleet has been deployed for the last 90 days uh, in uh, the Eastern Seas. Uh, it has held uh, uh, lengthy exercises, complex exercises with the Singapore Navy in the South China Sea. It's currently exercising with Australia uh, off the Australian coast. Uh, we've also, the fleet has also visited several countries in the region, uh, in particular Indonesia. Um, then, um, the, the final point which I'd like to, uh, uh, to make about this uh, defense partnership with the United States and its prospect is uh, that uh, uh, I think working together we can better shape uh, Asia's balances, uh, the power transitions which are underway, and uh, help establish a rules-based order. I forgot to mention counterterrorism. That's a very strong element of the India-US uh, uh, security partnership. Uh, Delegitimizing de terror and violent extremism is at the heart of it. And I think uh, there's a lot of progress which we've made. We'll continue to make more progress in times to come. Uh, final point, managing Asia. Now, I already alluded to Mike Green uh, and the US longstanding policy about, about Asia. Uh, it is true at the moment that the credibility of US power is under relentless challenge. Um, and uh, it's so equally true that uh, increasingly the East China Sea and South China Sea uh, look like contested spaces. So uh, this, is, this is the reality which we are dealing with. The countries in Southeast Asia are particularly alarmed and concerned about uh, these developments. Um, the Trump administration's broader strategic view of how to handle Asia uh, is uh, yet to emerge. Uh, thus far, there have been a few narrower uh, definitions of U.S. priorities, uh, generally limited to Northeast Asia. Uh, but uh, I'm quite sure that uh, as we go along, there will be greater clarity about the reliability of the U.S. role in Asia's broader balances. Um, we uh, uh, last point maybe. Uh, the, the, the China factor is, is big. It's, uh, it's, uh, China is uh, expanding its uh, influence through the Belt and Road Initiative, which you must have heard about. And uh, it's, a, it's a basically an exclusionary uh, uh, arrangement uh, where China gains economic dependencies, uh, political influence and leverage, and uh, Art and builds arteries for military power projection. So <coughs> that's the kind of orientation we see from the BRI. Um, the, uh, India's message to China has remained consistent. Uh, we, uh, our strategic messaging is that uh, no, India will not and does not kowtow. Uh, India will defend its sovereign interests. Uh, durable ties with China can be built only around mutual respect for each other's uh, interests, uh, and they uh, include sovereign territorial interests. So uh, this is something which you hear all the time. Uh, there is a lot of statements by Chinese leaders about uh, the importance of respecting sovereignty. But uh, I think uh, actions should speak louder than those words. Uh, and uh, certainly we would, India would welcome that. Uh, connectivity interests, uh, regional connectivity interests, we are involved across the board. Uh, our connectivity interests are mainly served by the sea lanes of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and that is why uh, Japan and India are working together uh, to uh, launch their own connectivity programs uh, from Africa down to Southeast Asia. Uh, the Japanese call it the free and open Indo-Pacific. And uh, in India, we recently, our prime minister launched the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. And uh, the difference between the BRI and these uh, corridors is that these are rules-based, transparent, consensus-driven counterpoints 
So uh, uh, this, is, this is the direction in which we will continue to grow. And I now uh, would like to hand over to the military experts. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, in my remarks, I'll address three important issues. Uh, my first part will be on the emerging power balance in Asia. The second part is what kind of possible scenarios that can occur as a, as a result of the power balance. And thereafter, lay out some goals, as Dr. Hicks told, talked about the fact that there is a lack of understanding in each of the schools, a trial to provide, provide a framework of Indo-US defense cooperation. Uh, from my perspective, there are four players in Asia uh, whose competitive dynamics are shaping the Asian regional order. The first is the United States and its allies, including Japan and Korea. The second is China and Russia, the two, but the etant between the two is an important factor, particularly in the continental space. And third, uh, the, the fourth one in this is India. Looking from the power dynamics point of view, we see that at this point in time, the China is using its growing economic and political and military heft to extend its strategic space from Eurasia to Pacific. Uh, having more or less concentrated its power structure in continental Asia is moving now into the maritime domain in a very, very purposeful manner. The second part is the Sino-Russian Ethan. Uh, the important part of the Russia's pivot east policy is uh, to create a power dynamics and, and correlation of power between China and Russia. The the, it, it is working in two domains. One is in the economic domain, which is not so good. It's sluggish at this point in time. Uh, there are not enough investments and, and convergences on the economic domain. But on the military domain, and as well as in the political domain, there is a huge amount of intensification of Russia-China ties, particularly in the diplomatic, defense, and military fields. What has been the impact of this is that this has allowed China to further expand its geopolitical space, and particularly in Eurasia. The third point on China is basically is this, that China is, has been successful in bringing small and medium powers in Asia into its sphere of influence through a carrot and stick policy based on economic inducements and coercion. Along with this, we also find China weighing on Western competition across the world, from Eurasia, Africa to Latin America, in a bit to what we see convert, creating a larger Beijing consensus that is aligning the world to Chinese interests. What is the perspective on the contrasting perspective on the maritime domain or as well as from the American perspective? First, is that despite five months in office, we do not see Trump administration's strategic uh, Asia Pacific strategy, uh, uh, you know, it, to, to the best extent, it remains work in progress. In addition, there are conflicting signals. The focus of the administration appears to be entirely North Korea centric, and there has been a little or no attention paid to what we call the broader Asia Pacific strategy, which is resulting in the fact is from the, from the South China Sea onwards right up to the Indian Ocean region, there is pr practically no American presence. So if you're looking at the rebalancing strategy, there is no rebalance west of South, South, South China Sea and into the Indian Ocean region. Coming to India, the Chinese gains in Eurasia, particularly its attempts to dominate the maritime space in South China Sea and IOR, and initiatives like the BRI and the Maritime Silk Road are having a deep impact on Indian security. India today, in addition to a strong continental challenge as along its boundaries, both with Pakistan and China, is now facing a, a major maritime challenge from chi spreading Chinese footprints. The, Im the worry from Indian side is that this complexity of this challenge is going to increase in the years to come. As China gains 
maritime capabilities and advances its maritime presence through bases and new alignments. There is also a policy of, co of concerted, concerted policy of coercion and containment of India's strategic space uh, and influence that we see emerging as part of Chinese moves. In the continental domain, this is based on what we, call, what we look at the developments in Pakistan in terms of CPEC and the Chinese attempts to forge a new corridor on our eastern sector from Yunnan through Myanmar and Bangladesh onto the Bay of Bengal called the BCIM. So this along with the new strung of Pearl strategy which is Amban Tota, Gwadar and onto the, the Djibouti, Djibouti, we are seeing this new alignments of Chinese bases taking place. So the littoral in the IOR is now being concentrated as a place of influence. So what is the import, important part of this is that we, there is from Indian perspective the uncertainty of our strategic partners particularly like I mentioned from the west of South China Sea into the Indian Ocean region is forcing India to look independently of its, of its security threats and challenges. And this to an extent we see is also emboldening our neighbor in the west to provide a flip to cross-border terror and proxy war. And you look in terms of strategic stability in our region, we, we find that uh, India is the only country in the world which faces two major nuclear powers, uh, uh, China and Pakistan, which has the fastest developing nuclear capability. In fact, from our perspective, Pakistan and North Korea are to be seen as part of the <coughs> Chinese diet and, and as an exclusivity of his deterrence perspective. In short, Pakistan, uh, sorry, China is using Pakistan to, con to contain India and North Korea to ensure that the developments uh, in, in Northeast Asia are, are kept in check. So, so to that extent, this nuclear diet is a very interesting concept which is being followed by the uh, Chinese. So what are this, all these developments mean? We see three possible scenarios emerging. In the medium term, short to medium term, we, we, we find China is going to bide its times and share leadership with the US to the extent possible while it addresses some of its own internal concerns, which are plenty. People who watch China understand that there are in huge amount of internal discourse, which is not so positive going on in China. The second part is that should this period work towards Chinese favor, we could, and there is the ambivalence on the United States continues, we will see that the Asian states will start following traditional balancing and hedging strategies and incrementally come within the circle of, of Chinese influence. And that is going to extend the Chinese space even larger. And the third stage would be a dominant and aggressive China pursuing its economic and political agenda could result, could create through these new power and influence what I called a new tributary system in Asia. So if this be the, the scenario, what are the, what could be the possible framework for inter-US relations? From my perspective, in the emerging Sinocentric scenario, the challenge for India and the United States is how to coalesce their power to balance China. We think that the three elements of joint strategic vision, that is connectivity, freedom of navigation, and collective security are central to coalition of this power. If we, if we, if we provide heft, flesh to these three elements, 
those elements will be good enough to ensure a degree of stability. I am purposely not using the word containment, stability in the region. Second is, <coughs> India together with US and its allies need to cooperate and coordinate their strategic and security policies to reassure regional players and provide them a counter narrative in the inevitability of the Chinese hegemony. So what does this mean? It essentially means is that there needs to be a greater degree of coherence and centrality to what I call Indo-US-Japan trilateral. Some of the specific areas that this trilateral needs to address are rekindling among ASEAN and other countries the commitment of the big three in Asia, that is United States, Japan and India, in providing a rule-based order and stable architecture. Collective desire to protect the freedom and navigation of fraud trade, interoperability and information exchange. And in this construct, we feel that it is important to move away from, move forward from white shipping agreements, which incidentally Japan agrees to but has not signed, <coughs> to pressurize or push on Japanese to sign that agreement and eventually moving towards black shipping ag uh, agreements, basically sharing military intelligence and military information. Consider developing India into a major logistic hub, which should be a uh, natural extension for logical extension of the Leoma, Limoa. Then the, this brings me to the importance of define, defining a joint framework for technology transfers, interoperability, and maintenance of logistics. We need to, we need to focus on these three areas there's something which uh, my colleague will also be addressing. The next point is we need to develop new structure of regional alignments. Focus on important ASEAN states to exercise control over slocks. Therefore, in the first instance, our suggestion is we could put a greater focus on Malacca group, in particular Malaysia, Indonesia and Singapore. We need to understand one thing, that India is a major power that straddles the Indian Ocean. We, our credibility of our power is comprehensive at this point in time, but not, may not be adequate. It is the adequacy part of this power, of the comprehensive national power, military power, that we need to be the focus. And that comprehensive of the ability of our national military power is in the maritime domain. So therefore, the correlationship of India-United States partnership must focus on upgrading offensive and defensive capabilities as joint partners to ensure that the freedom of this navigation, the slot security, and the, the, the island, the, the congruence of maritime dem democracies gets the heft that it requires. Please understand, in next 15 years, the, the area between the South China Sea to the Indian Ocean region will remain a Chinese vulnerability. <coughs> Till such time, Chinese consolidate their power. Idea here is not again to contain China, but the idea is to provide stability and to provide a certain salience of reassurances to the maritime littorals of, of, the, of Asia and in the Indian Ocean region, that the stable power balance is what is required. Thank you. Great. Uh, General Huja, the floor is over to you, sir. My colleague has just given the rationale for strategic and security imperatives in our regional security and what Dr. Hicks mentioned, that the responsibility of covering the sweet spot, as you said, of the specifics of defense cooperation, Indo-US defense cooperation, I'll try and cover that very briefly. We, we quite agree that 
in our bilateral relationship. Defense and security cooperation is a vital pillar. Now this vital pillar, this strategic partnership is about creating capabilities. It is about creating capabilities in a region with a security environment as was just covered so that at least you have certain alternatives, certain democratic alternatives to coercive, expansionist behavior which may exist in the region and where perhaps the national ambitions may be getting pushed beyond the national interests. So it's about capabilities, it's about giving alternatives. Thus the rationale which I go progressively, the rationale for Indo-US defense, co uh, or our defense cooperation. Most of you sitting here would be aware that we already have a large number of agreements, mechanisms, a large number of exercises which are already there in place. In terms of agreement, after our historic lows of 1971, which we are all aware of, we started our formal defense cooperation around 1995. We signed the joint minutes. Thereafter, 2005, we went on to define a framework of defense cooperation. 2013, we went on to sign a joint declaration on defense cooperation. 2015, we renewed the framework for defense cooperation, what we had signed in 2005 for another period of 10 years, which is there in vogue presently. Thereafter, we've gone on to 2014-15. We went on to Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, DTTI. I'll be covering this in little details subsequently. And then last year, we went on to India being declared as a major defense partner of the US. We'll again talk about it a little later. Now, out of all these agreements, let me touch upon uh, two, two of them, let me dwell upon them. The Joint Declaration on Defense of 2013. Uh, 2013. Now this placed us at the level of closest partners for the purpose of technology transfer, including advanced technologies. We spoke of joint R&D, co-development, co-production, refining of our licensing procedures and because of the nature of things contained in this, this actually became the framework for the DTTI. The agreements that we signed, this joint declaration actually formed a sort of a preamble for this. Thereafter, let's come on to the renewed framework of 2015. Like I said, it had built on the framework that was signed in 2005 and it has a currency of 10 years at, uh, of now. This again reiterates defense and security being the pillars of our mutual cooperation. Again, it focused on the 2013 declaration and then went on to spoke of promoting our security cooperation in terms of terrorism, cap capability de uh, development in uh, maritime sphere, and our addressing our common interests, of uh, common multinational interests. And then we spoke of in sharing missile defense, UN peacekeeping, mutually strengthening each other's capabilities in this. Now, in terms of our exercises, we started with Malabar series of exercises in 1992, except for a brief break between 1998 and 2002, they've, uh, oh, they've been going on very well. 
and we are going to have the current series of Malabar or current uh, edition of Malabar exercise early next month and to make them mission specific and to give more meaning to these exercises. The emphasis is going to be on anti-submarine warfare, uh, special operations, uh, special forces working together so that there is a substance in interoperability between the two. Besides that, we've done a number of joint exercises. India participated in RIMPAC last year. We, Air Force participated in uh, uh, Red Flag. And then we've been having exercises between our Army and the Special Forces also. As part of implementation of the Joint strateg uh, Strategic Vision, we had the Maritime Dialogue very recently, early this month. White Shipping Agreement. That's been signed. The technical part of it was signed about a year back. And the automated merchant shipping uh, or reporting system that the US has in place in the region, we understand that is being upgraded. The phase one is to finish by about this month, phase two by about next month. And I think the things are in place to get it operationalized. Lemoa, it's already been spoken of. We had signed it August 16. There are certain SOPs which are oh, being worked out. It will be a reasonable assumption to uh, assume that some of these SOPs, the two navies would try and run through these, some of these in Malabar exercise so that we are able to mature this in implementation. And as far as the other foundational agreements are concerned, well, they, they are an action in hand and any one of us sitting here would not be able to pitch a timeline as to when we'll be able to sign these. Just a thought for your consideration. That there is something about some agreement being called a foundational agreement. We experienced this when we went into signing Lemoa of the time that it took, is there a way that we cull out the operative parts of these declarations? And we come on to signing on these, like many a times we say, we, we come on to mission enabling technologies being exchanged. Could we work out mission enabling documents <laughs> that we sign between the concerned parties and we go ahead with it so that we have a functional substance in place without the trappings of a name in place. It's just for your consideration. Now, all these, all these agreements that we've had, there's just a common strand which runs through them. And whatever I highlighted so far, and whatever I'm going to talk of DTTI or a major defense partner, We've spoken of exchange of technology, including the most advanced technology. We've spoken of joint R&D. We've spoken of co-development, co-production. We've all done that. And we've also said that strengthening US-India defense trade is not an end in itself but as a means to strengthen the security of both countries. I'm repeating this again, what I said at the beginning. It's strengthening both the countries, it's developing both the capabilities, it's not an end in itself. And we have to achieve better interaction between our defense forces, which we do in a number of exercises. So how do we realize this basic understanding that it is for developing our mutual capabilities? And as Ambassador had just mentioned, that this developing of mutual capabilities is at no cost to any of the taxpayers here. It comes at our cost. We develop our capability. And of course, we need assistance in developing our technology, in developing our industry, all of us sitting here are quite conscious that our friends around 
you help the industry to grow in Japan, you help the industry to go in South Korea, the defense industry. Is there a way a similar kind of defense industry could grow in India for which there are tremendous opportunities, which will, I'll be mentioning a little later. Now a word about specifically about DTTI. DTTI, I've already mentioned it. It, DTTI, Carter Initiative, whatever way you want to call this, it became like a picture postcard defense cooperation program. 2015 onwards is found reference in every joint statement of every <laughs> leader between our two countries who's either come here or gone to Delhi. Now we had a five-fold aim when we started making the, the terms of reference for it, drawing up the aims for it. And basically the aims were that let's resolve process issues because when Secretary Panetta, when he decided, or when Dr. Ashton Carter, when he went initially, when we were talking of DTTI, 2012-2013, uh, when we were talking about it, we said, it's not a treaty, it's not a law. It's a flexible mechanism for our senior level engagement and oversight, that we have problems in interacting with each other. We have problems with our procedures, we have problem, problems with our regulations. But how do we draw focus into these? So the aim was resolve process issues and alignment of our systems, increase flow of technology, increase flow of investment, support co-development and co-production and cooperate in R&D. Now basically, these were five fundamental. We added a few more things, which was expand US-India defense trade, which as I just said, is not an end in itself. And the purpose, I've already said that more than once. And strengthen industrial, India's industri uh, defense industrial base. And by moving away from traditional buyer-seller relationship to adopting a more collaborative approach. And as it was defined, if you look at perhaps the Pentagon site, you might find that it is said that we need to transform this bilateral relationship into, a, into one that is limited only by independent strategic decision rather than bureaucratic obstacles and inefficient procedures. Well, DTTI, and when I was officially part of it, we were hammered a number of times that you are the people who create bureaucratic obstacles. You are absolutely inefficient. You are absolutely useless. But well, there are things which are attributable to our regulation. They are attributable to our procedures. And that's the challenge of getting our defense cooperation. Was that a CSIS going. report you're quoting? <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, there, there are issues. We understand that many of the IPRs lie with the private industry. There are, they are your crown jewels. Nobody would like to part with them. But please listen to the aspiration of a huge buyer who has the unenvious position of being the largest buyer of arms. And I say that unenvious position, I quote it once again. Now, isn't it a legitimate aspiration for any large scale buyer when we talk that it's not a buyer seller relationship to get something in addition to the equipment that I get to get some technology with it, to get some manufacturing with it. And this is where we've had a difference in views that where the primacy from the Indian side has been on getting technology, the primacy in the US perception has been on trade. Now, a word about a major defense partner. National Defense Authorization Act. Well, it said 
most of the things that I have repeated two or three times over. Technology, co-development, co uh, trade, improving licensing process. And in fact, uh, in resolving these issues, we would be keen to know that this uh, joint report was to be given to the Senate after 180 days of this act being approved. And we are near 180 days, we are in June, as to what are likely to be the regulations, which or procedures that may be improved that we can make a headway. Now, coming to the next part, very briefly about trade and opportunities that are available. Now, in trade, last 10 years, 14 billions, what all has been bought? I think everybody here in this hall knows about it. Uh, in developing this last year, we, we revamped our defense procurement procedure and reissued it in 2016. Many of you sitting here would feel that, no, it's not made much of a difference. In fact, it was promulgated in March, end March, and it actually started getting implemented by about July or so. And any of you who's remotely familiar with defense acquisitions would realize that a couple of months is no time for even to, for the cases to start coming in the new form. The next major development has been the policy, India's policy for developing strategic partners for, plat for major platforms. We, it, it is new to us. We've taken nearly two years, one year while we were making the defense procurement procedure and one year thereafter. And it's just been approved by our cabinet committee on security on 24th May, less than a month back. Now, to start off with, We've gone in for four major platforms, fighter aircraft, helicopters, submarines, and armored fighting vehicles. Now in this, we will be selecting one strategic partner, which will be an Indian private industry because the aim of this developing strategic partners is to bring the capability of defense production into the private sector. And concurrently, we'll be selecting one OEM globally, whichever weapon meets our basic requirements. And then the two would be matched. And thereafter, a strategic partner would be selected. And this strategic partner would be responsible for giving us that weapon platform and for the subsequent maintenance of this. Any specifics can be covered separately. But this is a huge opportunity. And besides strategic partner, the overall opportunities that are available, which are there in the public domain, is we are talking of fighter aircraft for our Air Force, single engine fighter aircraft. We are talking of carrier borne aircraft for our Navy. We are talking of five ton category helicopters for our Navy. We are talking of 10 to 12 ton category of multi-role helicopters for our, for our Navy. We are talking of UAVs, etc. And opportunities are available in all of them. So having given you a, a brief background of the agreements that we have, the exercises that we have, and the very rationale on which our defense cooperation is built and what the opportunities we have. If I was to sum up that what are the promises that we offer in India-US defense cooperation and how do we give momentum to it? Well, the promise. The promise is the momentum of Indo-US cooperation will remain. We are committed to this relationship. The promise also is that we will develop our own capabilities. We'll do it. We've taken time. Gentlemen, during my service for 40 years, serving in certain operational areas, when one sat on old rickety helicopters, one always felt that I should have got a new helicopter yesterday. 
But yeah. today when I sit here, I realize it was a price worth paying for building a nation's capability. That if we have waited, if we have thought, if we took time to develop strategic partners, and if we develop our indigenous capability, it was worth the wait. So the second promise is, we'll build our capability. We'll do our indigenization. And uh, we will fulfill our regional responsibilities, whether it pertains to the security in Indo-Asia Pacific region, or the security of the SLOCs, or our responsibilities as providing a democratic alternative. And the momentum, momentum in terms of external momentum is all these agreements, all these talks that we are having is external momentum of developing our, giving strength to our relationship. And the internal momentums are refining our defense procurement procedures, defining our strategic partnership, building our industry, bringing it to the private sector. This is what will give momentum. And I think we will be able to mutually bring our defense cooperation together. Any Great. specific questions, I'll be happy to answer. Great, thank you so much. Good. Well, uh, I don't know if, Kath, if you have any thoughts or questions, but one thing I wanted to, I did want to pick your brain on a little bit. Uh, Brigadier Segal talked about um, India and the rebalance. I mean, to me, from the outside, in the private sector the whole time, but just sort of, you know, listening to whatever Claudio was saying inside or something like that, uh, um, <laughs> it sort of looked like India was always a bit out of sync. You know, you had the sort of a pivot towards India during the Bush administration in a pretty big way, uh, but then with MMRCA and nuclear kind of falling off, then shifting away at about the time the pivot was articulated. How, you know, being in the Pentagon at the time, how, how did India kind of fit in? Was it, was it a strategic element? Was it something that was kind of done separately? How, how, how do you kind of characterize it? Oh, I, I definitely think it was a strategic element. Uh, but yes, it was, it, it was not, um, it, it aligned well, uh, mm. if you will forgive the pun. There was an alignment um, for us with India at, at just the right time where we were already looking at a rebalance that was frankly very much about um, shifting more across um, Northeast and Southeast Asia. And South Asia was not, in, in the immediate sphere of what was being talked about um, centrally at the time. It was always there, but it was sort of tertiary. And then I think what happened is, particularly with regard to um, India's, frankly, internally changing viewpoints on, on China, the uh, shift in party, um, ultimately, um, inside India, and um, also the uh, uh, changing dynamics with regard to Pakistan, the U.S.-Pakistani relationship. I think all of those pieces together with a general propensity toward defense trade reform, if I can use that, wasn't a term we would have used that way, but export control reform, foreign military sales reform, which was, um, has been a, a, a trend line, I guess I would say overall, but certainly um, Secretary Gates had pushed on that and combatant commands had pushed on that and, there were, and much progress was being made. Um, I think all those factors came together in that 2012, 2013 timeframe. And I think they have, again, all of those really have accelerated in the time since then, as I was indicating, to sort of continue to propel that relationship and that alignment forward. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, Hamant and, and, and General Hujab. So, um, as we're sort of, you know, in the conversations that I've been having within the U.S. government, preparations for the summit, or, or broadly looking at, looking at uh, Prime Minister Modi, President Trump, and, and how they might, uh, how they might interact. You know, India didn't have a lot of centrality, I think, in terms of some of the major international focuses during the campaign, and even not so much sense. I mean, you can find statements here and there when asked by a member of Congress. Will you maintain the trajectory with India? Yes, I will, things like that. But, um, but the question is, you know, I think on the defense side, you know, we had high level, serious engagement. I mean, Secretary Carter, I believe, saw Parakar more than any other defense minister in the world. And so a lot of times we're asking ourselves, okay, if, if, if General Mattis is not gonna be visiting India or hosting India with that same frequency, can the same kind of agreements and cooperation move ahead 
without cabinet level, without minister level, without political level engagement? Is it strong enough now where that can be sustained below the level of minister and political? Or are we still going to need that to continue to break new ground? If there's something, some new iteration of the foundation agreements, or um, if new defense technology trade initiative programs are put on, or moving forward with the existing ones, can that be done below that level now if you don't have minister level, or do you think it still takes that level of engagement? Well, let me uh, briefly answer that, but uh, Arun can add to, to my answer. Um, there is definitely going to con be a continued need for high level engagement. Uh, it's a new administration. So we're not dealing, uh, India, the government is the same as, as was the case last year. Uh, in the United States, we have a new administration. So uh, building the blocks of the relationship, uh, including at the cabinet level uh, with the new administration is going to be a important aspect. Uh, I did allude, but did not uh, elaborate uh, that uh, the discussions, uh, uh, they were not, they were over the phone, they were not uh, in person. But discussions between Mattis and, uh, and Parika uh, were very good. And uh, they, they signaled continuity of the arrangements which uh, have existed or been created by Ash Carter. Uh, the discussions, again, at the level of uh, the National Security Advisor uh, have been similarly uh, reassuring and positive. So uh, uh, while, while the summit level engagement on next Monday will determine a broader direction uh, of, uh, for the future, uh, I think uh, we are quite confident that uh, that, that direction will, be, uh, will continue to give momentum to these three elements of our relationship, which is the convergences on strategic issues, the security partnership, and the defense relationship. So we're quite sanguine about that. Yeah. Uh, can I? Uh, <coughs> just one, one yeah. but then you can. You know, uh, the, the, there is a new thinking in India. That's something you have to capture. The, the thing is, uh, this government is very keen and focused on developing military capabilities in concert with India's strategic interests. So they are not, they are not uh, in the business of, of just talking, but they are, they are, they are walking the talk. And, and, and therefore, that's the mood that needs to be captured. And how is that, that mood is to be captured is that there has to be an understanding that while processes, procedures, and uh, political uh, heft is being provided to the India's policy issues, uh, in, in particularly in context of the United States, like my colleague said, they, you also need to look at this whole thing and not be hidebound by the conceptualness of your agreements or the or the or the legalized legalities of your uh, agreements. You have to move beyond that and 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 create specific India-oriented structures. That is the only way to move forward. I mean, we I just give you an example. We had a, a arrangement with Russia. We, we gave them, it was a separate arrangement with Russia under which we used to buy, buy equipment. And that's worked. That worked. So similarly, we need to look at a, that kind of a, a, a country-specific approach. More general huja will... See, we, we have structures in place, we have a rationale in place. And even Dr. Ka uh, Ashton Carter was not the Secretary of Defense throughout this period. He was only there February, uh, February 15 onwards. So there was DTTI, there was cooperation before that. Yes, there, 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 are, personal, there, there are personal commitments, there are personal pushes. It works. But in the larger scheme of things, this structure of DTTI that has been put in place, it has all elements of everybody who's involved, whether it's the Ministry of Defense or Ministry of External Affairs or DRDO or the industry. There are nine joint working groups which are already in place. So today, can we 
the momentum has been put in place and as it is it was said that we have to refine the processes and what to quote in one of the meetings uh, or dr ashton carter mentioned that at this stage what we are doing is we are training our bureaucracy to overcome these obstacles so things have happened and you would have heard some responsible offici uh, officials quoting that where a project agreement used to take up to three to three and a half years to get signed you brought it down to signing project agreements in six months from three and a half years to six months was a change now this huge opportunities that i spoke of where the possibilities of strategic partners are there can one look aside sit aside sit out of it to be a part of those opportunities and then to realize when things are happening in the asia pacific region the way they are happening can one sit aside and not help somebody develop a capability so there's a there's a rationale in place there's a structure in place and the geo strategic environment is changing so all these ensure that the moment and the intention is there on both sides they will ensure that the system will continue beyond the oh, personalities per se but well, i think that's one of the uh, on our side one of the things that we have to know whether our our government will overcome which is you know what is india going to do with that technology has always been the response but i think in recent years we've been we've been comfortable not trying to define that and knowing that india's strength alone and and acting in its own interest was good but um whether whether that ambiguous what is the end look like in that you know i don't know whether this administration has thought about that and and is ready to be responsive to that so i guess we'll know a bit more in the coming days. We've got about uh, 10 or 11 minutes here. Um, so if others have questions, uh, Ambassador Sobhan, I see in the front row that we have a microphone, I think coming across to the front. Yep, it's uh, moving its way. In the front row, Ambassador Farouk Sobhan. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, three excellent uh, presentations. Uh, who was the bad one of the four? <laughs> uh, I actually uh, sympathize with uh, Dr. Hicks. Uh, it's a rather difficult situation to be in at the moment. And, um, my question to the uh, three Indian friends is um, looking at the issues of convergence and divergence uh, in the area of defense and security cooperation. What would be your thoughts about uh, the recent visit of President Trump to Saudi Arabia and the outcome of that visit? Uh, I refer specifically to uh, uh, two issues. Uh, one is, of course, uh, Iran, uh, and the other would be uh, Qatar. And do you see uh, convergence in terms of uh, uh, working together with the U.S. Uh, in Afghanistan? Uh, because I see that as a possible area where uh, there could be convergence. And my last point is uh, defense cooperation with Russia. I thought that is still moving ahead, uh, although you seem to suggest that the Russians were tilting more heavily towards the Chinese. But does that preclude defense cooperation with Russia? Well, let me answer those, <clears throat> those three points. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, firstly, as far as uh, uh, West Asia is concerned, uh, uh, this government, Prime, Prime Minister Modi in particular, has invested very deeply in relationships in the area. Uh, he has precisely visited Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Qatar, all three countries, on state visits. Uh, we've made a, uh, we have made a very uh, significant breakthrough on security partnerships and counterterrorism partnerships with all three. 
uh, we have uh, we have huge investments there in in the in the sense that, uh, as you know, there are between six and eight million Indians who are working in uh, in West Asia, in, and and these three countries included. Uh, so, uh, what we are going to wait and see what is the outcome of uh, the the kind of uh, things which were talked about. There were some elements which are obviously very good, the the element of uh, of a counterterrorism coalition against violent extremism uh, and clamping down on uh, on uh, on financing for terrorism uh, those are elements which are clearly uh, going to be looked at positively uh, we don't really know about the repercussions uh, in terms of instability uh, which uh, may arise uh, uh, because of the iran factor uh, we have to wait and see there Iran is, an, uh, is a very important neighbor for us. Our prime minister has paid a state visit to Iran as well. Uh, and uh, there are connectivity issues as well as uh, oil and gas issues which link us uh, closely with, the, with Iran. So I think uh, there are lots of balls in the air at the moment. We, we, we've got to see how this, uh, uh, the outcomes of that visit uh, uh, of uh, President Trump to Saudi Arabia will, will play out. Uh, our hope is that uh, uh, whichever way it goes, it should it should strengthen stability rather than instability, and uh, 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 that's one. The second Afghanistan question, uh, in India's approach uh, and the American approach in in, uh, in Afghanistan has always been complementary. Uh, we have three billion dollars worth of economic investment, uh, grant assistance investment in Afghanistan, building capacity, building democratic capacity, building. Uh, dams, uh, hydroelectric power plants, building uh, roads, uh, increasing connectivity. Um, the relationship at the people to people level between Afghanistan and India is, has always been significantly warm. It continues to be so. Their expectation out of us on the defense side is great. Uh, we are mainly involved in the training of uh, um, uh, Afghan officers and, and uh, military personnel. Uh, we've also supplied uh, some uh, combat helicopters uh, of Russian origin uh, to the Afghan forces. Uh, so as I said, these are comp complementary engagements. America is heavily involved in the security side, and we, we are very strongly involved in the stabilization and economic uh, uh, side in Afghanistan. I don't see that uh, uh, will change very much. Uh, that focus uh, remains steadfast. Uh, Prime Minister went to Afghanistan in the middle of all these uh, uh, fairly precarious uh, uh, security situations which exist there. And uh, uh, the, the, the question really is, how deep is the commitment of all, all the neighbors of uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, to invest in its uh, uh, well-being and stability? And, uh, without the notion of interference in uh, Afghan's national, Afghanistan's national affairs. Um, so uh, we hope that uh, there will be something positive, uh, but we don't know yet because the administration's uh, Afghan strategy is going to be known only some, sometime by the middle of July. Uh, we'll wait and see how things uh, fit in after that. There was a third part of your question, which was... Uh, Ties with China. Russia. Ties issue. with Russia. No, no, no. I mean, with the China uh, please, lines. Please, no, no. The, I mean, so, uh, I don't want you to go away with the impression uh, that uh, we are in any shape or form uh, reducing the salience or importance of a continued, very robust strategic partnership between India and Russia. We just had a hugely successful uh, summit meeting in St. Petersburg between uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Putin. Uh, we are moving forward on, on both the civil nuclear cooperation side as well as the uh, the defense partnership side there are difficulties in all the relationships they acknowledge them quite candidly that yeah we've been slow sometimes things have taken time uh, they've been cost overruns etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, you always need to work around uh, uh, such situations however for both the united states and uh, russia this new reality has to be understood which is the strategic partnership model. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's now our official policy that in these four areas where we need huge investments over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, 
these will be on the basis of pre-selection of strategic partners and their foreign origin o OEMs. And uh, uh, this, is, this is something which, uh, which is new, which has not been tried before. Uh, but it brings to light <coughs> what has been an aspiration for a long time, that is a level playing field for India's private sector to participate in defense production. And that's a good thing. Uh, the op the uh, obviously, the advantage will go to, to the major OEMs and uh, out of the world's 100 top uh, military OEMs, I think 50 are in the United States. Well, we're running pretty short, so if I can ask, uh, somebody has a quick, deeply penetrating, fantastic question. Uh, <laughs> if you could tell us uh, your name, who you represent, <coughs> and, and keep the question brief, please. Uh, we'll go uh, right on the, uh, by the aisle over here. Yeah, Tushar's got a microphone coming behind you. Hi, uh, thank you all for, for speaking to us today. My name is Sahil Singhvi, I'm with the Asia Group. Uh, my question is regarding uh, particularly what you said, General Ahuja, about um, defense industry ties between the US and India uh, and, and the, the generally rosy picture that you painted of um, how you expect these to play out over the next couple years. Uh, in the wake of President Trump's comments about the H-1B visa, comments about um, uh, the Paris Climate Accord and, and kind of you know, allegations about India, uh, and his, his, uh, the, the kind of good outcome that came out of the, the, the meeting with President Xi, uh, as well as you know, his walk back of comments on China, do you feel that there is any sort of threat to uh, this kind of generally positive outlook that you have, or do you do you you know remain confident that the the summit between the the two heads of state is going to you know go swimmingly and be as productive as you know past negotiations have been in the past eight years? Thank you. Uh, I don't know what kind of uh, well I I I, I understand. Uh, what way you're getting at? Firstly, as far as uh, climate change issues and uh, and other issues are concerned, we remain on course. We we we, we are uh, committed to the Paris Agreement, and uh, uh, not only we are are we committed, but our process of uh, 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 moving over to renewables uh, is accelerating faster than uh, what we ourselves may have imagined uh, across the board. So I mean that's not a that's not an issue because it's a national decision for the United States or the U.S. president to take what what is the policy of the United States towards climate change. We respect that. Uh, there was another issue which you mentioned about H one B. H one B. Yes, H one B. Look, uh, let me let me explain the thing to you in just two or three sentences. First, uh, the. Enhanced fees for H-1B visas were already introduced by the Obama administration. This administration has not made any change to that. It's just it's it's a carryover from the, from the past. The the change of approach in this administration is to review the entire gamut of immigration issues. So that we wait and see when and how that review will take place. As far as uh, India's uh, companies are concerned, uh, well. 80% of Indians hired under H-1B are hired by American companies. So, I mean, this is an issue which uh, American companies will have to uh, uh, address. Just 20% uh, work at Indian affiliates or, or American subsidiaries of Indian, major Indian IT companies. Uh, however, uh, <coughs> again, uh, this debate between, I don't want to get into this debate whether it's a, it's a services trade issue or it's an immigration issue. Uh, it's an endless debate, doesn't, uh, doesn't lead anywhere. We, we really wait and see what kind of actual policies come out of the Congress or out of the administration on this matter. Uh, India's uh, in IT companies are globally competitive. Uh, they have enhanced uh, the uh, 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 outputs of America's major multinationals for, for two decades now, and I don't see that uh, uh, changing because they are actually competitivity enablers uh, really in terms of uh, uh, in interjecting technology into the interface and making American multinationals even more competitive. 
So I don't see much change as far as our companies and their approach towards this is con concerned. They've already switched over the last four or five years to the global sourcing model or global, uh, they, they de define it in different ways. And uh, I, I think that platform is, uh, they're, they're fine with it. They're, you're going to see some announcements next week, I, at least so I'm told. Uh, don't hold me to it, but uh, mm. you're going to see some uh, some announcements in the margins at the business meeting uh, between Indian and American businesses, which will address some of these issues. Uh, you talked about the impact of all these things on uh, on defense. Uh, as I said earlier, we have no reason to believe that the fundamental drivers of convergences between India and the United States are going to change anytime soon. In fact, there might be a trend where they become even more deep. And on the defense side, uh, we, we've had very good interactions. I think the, the, it's a very good possibility that uh, the defense trade and technology issues are going to be taken forward even faster under this administration. So that's the, that's the outlook which I wish to share with you. Yeah. There was a couple of, are you guys time constrained right now? No, no, we are right fine, now? we are Kath, fine, till, have, till three we are yeah. fine, then we have to go off to the next Well, I see, I think we have something, okay, can we take one more? Yeah, sure. okay, one more question. Yeah, right in the aisle there. Uh, if you can make it very brief here, um, and uh, <laughs> again, your name, your organization, and just uh, Sure, my name is Balaji Venkatesan, and the uh, organization is CSD Solutions, and we do cybersecurity services. I have, uh, my question is twofold, one, to Brigadier General um, Sagal, you talked about the importance of maritime um, power and comprehensive role of Indian government in the Indian Ocean, why it's important for the peace of the whole region, right? And what about the uh, uh, stability of the region in terms of China's growing influence among the neighbors of India, for example, Pakistan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka? How is that playing into the overall US-India strategy, if at all? The second part of the question is to Lieutenant General Ahuja. Real, you real talked real about... Place. Yeah, you talked about strategic partnership that should be beyond a buyer and seller between United States and America, right? So where do you see the cyber capabilities, cyber security, cyber warfare, offensive and defensive capabilities? Is that part of the strategic framework that you're looking at between India and United States? So China engagement in South Asia with the neighbors and cyber security, security as part of strategic, uh, I will come to it. Okay. okay. <laughs> I hope I made my question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. A great question. Uh, fundamental is that, like I said, <laughs> that China has already started. Uh, it has it has has a fairly good control over the continental space. As Chinese power grows, it it econom economy needs trade, and maritime trade routes are its principal areas of of its trade movement. Maritime trade movement along the sea lines of communications, along the IOR, and then when they go to South China Sea, is a $5 trillion business. Security is imperative. The question basically is, if you can we create an architecture which is complementary to everybody instead of using balance of power strategies? When Chinese movement of submarines, nuclear submarines starts taking place and, and new bases come up and Gwadar and etc., Hamban Tota, etc. comes up as well as there's a new Kaikafu area, the western Myanmar, there's a huge energy hub which is being constructed and there are some other movements, I don't want to waste time. But the question is that that is taking place. So what I'm, what suggestion is very simple. All countries astride the littorals of on either side of the Malacca and going into the South China Sea should combine together to create a secure and peaceful maritime environment. And in that, it is in the interest of the, of the uh, we, we look at this whole construct as confluence of maritime democracies. And this whole confluence of maritime democracies in which United States is an important partner along with Japan and Southeast Asian littorals and India, have to combine together, work together to create this architecture of peace and stability. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Your second question was uh, related to 
uh, cyber security and does it come within the ambit of the strategic partnership as we are thinking of it today? Uh, well, the short answer is as of now, no. Uh, what we are sorry. It's no, a, the, short, there, there okay. is a, the short answer is yes. <laughs> the, the, we, we already signed a, 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 a major agreement between India and the United States on working together on cyber issues. This understanding was the first to be reached among major players in the world. Uh, 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 and this is already more than a year ago. Uh, so, however, at the operational level, the general is absolutely right. At the operational level, what's happening uh, in terms of, uh, of the military elements of, uh, of the cyber issue, that, let him address that. No. Uh, so it's, there's no conflict. No, you must no, no, there was no. That, uh, that See, the issue is, this, this is what agreement we've signed, this is our relationship. It's a very important thing which has to be carried forward. However, when we talk of the strategic partner in the context that I spoke of, we were talking of four major platforms. Oh, yeah. And we spoke of four systems of systems, yeah, yeah. where we are trying to bring them together. So today, as terms within the ambit of strategic partnership, as I said, we are not including it. But in the larger context, this relationship, uh -huh. Oh, already the agreement has been signed and it will be carried forward. It will definitely be carried forward. Even these four segments would subsequently be expanded. So the strategic partner series, <laughs> the four areas in which India is looking at the strategic partner solution to its defense needs, that's separate. And <coughs> the strategic partnership expanding and including cyber security and uh, cyber issues, that's a separate element. Both are ongoing, and uh, I, I can. I mean, there's the the misunderstanding is only the terminology, because the the, the defense ministry's new <laughs> policy is strategic partner, not partnership. And uh, in the ambit of India-U.S. strategic partnership, cyber issues, cyber security issues are very much part of it. Well, seven or eight days from now, uh, we'll have uh, some of these answers. Hopefully the leaders can cobble together and figure out how we continue, you know, these great programs that have led to some real successes in recent years. Uh, special thanks, Kath, to International Security Program here at CSIS and for your great leadership on so many of these issues. And especially to our great friends uh, from Delhi Policy Group coming all the way from India and really, uh, I think, uh, offering up some great insights ahead of the summit. So, so thanks, Haymont, and thanks to the team for coming out and for uh, joining us today. Uh, and hopefully we have a great summit in a few days. Cheers. Yeah.